Welcome to Range Law and Principles. My name is April Hewlett and I'm with the University of Idaho and today we are going to discuss rangelands of the world. Here's a map of a world with different rangeland biomes um, classified and this is a map created by Ava Strand, Karen Launchbaugh, and Chris Bernal up at the University of Idaho and it's based off the global database created by the World Wildlife Fund. So these rangeland biomes, as you can see, cover a lot of the world, but do you recall how much of the world is actually covered by rangelands? If you said 47% of the Earth's surface is rangelands, then you're correct. This is nearly two times that of forest and five times more than cropland. So clearly you can go almost anywhere on the earth and study rangelands and the same principles and practices that we learn in class can be applied in these different areas. One of the things that I love most about rangelands is even though I decided to have a career in the Great Basin, which I think is one of the best places on the earth, um, I still have colleagues in Australia that I collaborate with regularly. We're looking at how we can increase our um, increase our restoration success when we see different species here in the Great Basin. They're doing that same thing on Australia. They have wildfires just like we do and they need to restore their landscapes. So we can have colleagues all across the world. I have colleagues in Turkey that are looking at the same shrub kind of dynamics that I do with sagebrush, they do over in Turkey. And so really there's so many possibilities and I hope that as we go through today and we look at these different rangelands across the world that you can start to see there are connections and really your possibilities are limitless. Just to refresh what we talked about a few days ago, rangeland biomes fall on this end of lower precipitation amounts and a wide range in temperature. And so when we go through these biomes, kind of have this in mind. We're not, we're not in tropical rainforests for sure. So the first biome we're going to talk about is grasslands and grasslands as you can see on the graph are typically have a range in temperature. They're not extreme in either direction but they have lower precipitation and grasslands occur on all the continents except for Antarctica. Grasslands are obviously dominated by grasses as you can see in each of these pictures. These plants are typically well adapted to grazing and fire. If you're familiar with some of the grasslands in the United States, you know that a lot of these communities evolved with bison. So obviously they're adapted to grazing. And the same with fire. Fire is a natural process and they have those meristematic tissues down towards the ground so they can survive a lot of fire. So these are just a few things to think about when we consider grasslands. A lot of times we'll hear grasslands referred to as steppe. So for example, we say we have the sagebrush steppe here in the western southern Idaho. And steppe is referring to a grassland or extensive plains without trees. So like I said earlier, grasslands are found on every continent except for Antarctica. And Wrangell.org is a great source to understand these different rangeland biomes and to highlight each of these across our globe. So here, for example, in the United States, we have the short grass prairie. We also have the mixed grass prairie and the tall grass prairie, but the arrows pointing to short grass. You know, in southern Africa, we have the veld grasslands and in Australia, the Mitchell grasslands. And there are so many more, but Wrangell.org can really highlight different areas, especially as we explore rangelands across the globe. So for each of the biomes, I have a video that I would like you to watch. And this one's about the Mitchell grasslands in Australia. And it's really interesting to learn about these different um, grassland types across the world. And when they talk about them, think about some of the principles that we've learned in class and how they're also bringing them up here when they're trying to manage their Australian grasslands just like we manage our grasslands here in the United States. It's been a great summer for rainfall throughout most of eastern Australia and the Mitchell grass country especially has had well above average rainfall. Uh, 
G'day, David. G'day, John. How are you? Very well. How are you? Good to see you. Great to see you. Yeah. yeah. Here we yeah. are in this magnificent Mitchell grass country. We are. We are indeed. And isn't it magnificent country? Especially at the moment after the the well above average summer that we had. I guess one of the really interesting things about Mitchell grass is that it's it's endemic to Australia, so it only grows in Australia on these these heavy clay soils, and very very productive. So it's a perennial grass, and particularly by the dry season, middle of the middle of our winter, it's a really good standover feed. It's almost like a standing haystack for cattle and sheep production. So that's that's one of the key values really of Mitchell grass itself. It's that long-lived perennial. Individual plants can live 20, 30 years quite easily. But Mitchell grass is also uh, pretty important for our um, native animals and so on as well, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. There's there's quite a few species of dunnarts and and small, I guess, mouse-like Australian marsupials that live exclusively in in the open grasslands of of Mitchell grass country, and budgerigars and just these big flocks of green and blue budgies flying through is really stunning. Yeah, so this really is a, a, a key rangeland type in Australia. It's important for livestock production and it is important for our biodiversity and so on as well. Yes. So John, one of the key things in terms of managing Mitchell grass is at the end of the grazing season to have left about 15 to 20 centimetres of stubble height. If it's grazed flat down to the ground, then the grass has to reshoot from the crown. And it can do that, but it takes more rain. So it's less, efe it's less efficient for it mm. to actually respond. Another important thing that we're learning more recently is the value of spelling country, so of resting the country, especially when it's first coming away from those, those initial summer rains. Well, uh, David, um, we've been talking to a lot of managers and so on about how they manage for climate variability, but um, how does a plant do it in, uh, in this incredible variable climate that we deal with? Actually, let's go back to the, to the lab, John, because what I've got there is a Mitchell grass tussock on display, roots and all, and we can, we can have a good look at the mechanisms of, of it coping with drought and that sort of thing back in the lab. Well, that sounds fabulous. Let's, okay. let's do that, David. Let's go. Yeah, good. Come through, John. Thanks, Dave. Well, what have we got here? This looks fascinating. So whilst normally we can walk around the paddock and see what's happening above the ground, getting a real sense of what the roots are doing below ground is, is quite difficult. The only published information was from the 1940s of what was happening below ground. So we grew some Mitchell grass plants in large pots under controlled conditions so that we could then wash all the soil away from the roots and, and really see how much root activity and growth you get in a, in a single season. So this particular plant was grown from a seedling over one wet season. Quite amazing how well it can establish given, given good moisture. But these roots just really keep coming down and tapping into that deep moisture and that's what really keeps the Mitchell grass plant alive during our dry winters, and really importantly, during a drought. As well as those really deep roots, it has a concentration of roots in the top about 20 centimetres, and they can tap into the, the shallower moisture following rain, rainfall events. So it's this dual root system, these two layers of roots, that really enable the Mitchell grass plant to survive a drought and then respond quickly to rainfall. So the next biome we'll talk about is shrublands, and shrubland types occur in both xeric and mesic ecosystems. Xeric means dry. It's related or adapted to really dry climates. In these climates, we have a lot of our moisture that is lost through evapotranspiration, and oftentimes this loss through evapotranspiration exceeds the moisture that's received through rainfall. Mesic, on the other hand, refers to more of a moderate or well-balanced supply of moisture. And depending on whether you're in xeric or mesic ecosystems, you're going to have different shrub species. So shrublands, they are obviously dominated by shrubs. 
but they can also be a transitional community when we think about succession. One of the most important things to think about is, or to understand as land managers is your site potential. And when you understand that, you can get an idea of whether the shrubland is a transitional area or whether the shrubs are the climax communities for that area. When it's a transitional area between a grassland and a forest, for example, it's typically a result of some kind of disturbance. And maybe that's a fire or logging or overgrazing. All of these can make that shift. One of the fascinating things about shrublands that we just talked about, especially those in xeric ecosystems, they're going to have really small leaves. And when they have these small leaves, it limits how much water is lost. So oftentimes, you can look at different leaves and you can understand, in shrublands at least, kind of some of the climate patterns that you might see or might find. Here is a quick look of the shrublands across the world. And again, this is from Ringle.org. But you can see, I mean, they span the entire world. And a lot of the principles and practices that we learn about our shrubs here can apply to all these different areas across the world. So here's a quick video about shrublands. So take a few minutes to watch it. Sagebrush. Its distinctive scent permeates Wyoming's air and its foliage provides the distinctive grayish hue to many of our landscapes. Basin Big Sagebrush is the biggest species in the cowboy state. Almost two-thirds of Wyoming is populated by sage. It is the naturally dominant or climax species on much of that ground. Sagebrush prospers where there is winter snow, and it helps perpetuate itself by intercepting blowing snow, creating many drifts, and using the water when they melt. Most sagebrush is knee to waist high, but the basin big sagebrush subspecies can grow to nearly tree-like stature in ravines or other favorable places. Sagebrush is an essential food and habitat requirement for deer, antelope, sage grouse, and many other wildlife species, especially in winter. You can imagine how this would create superb winter cover. Love it or hate it, sagebrush is the quintessential Wyoming plant. From the University of Wyoming Cooperative Extension Service, I'm Barton Stam, exploring the nature of Wyoming. So the next biome we'll talk about is woodland and savannas. And these are really interesting biomes that um, obviously get a little bit more precipitation than a lot of our grasslands and shrublands. Here's a quick map of some of the woodlands and savannas across the world. So we typically in the United States have more of the woodland side versus places like Africa might have more of the savanna. And we'll talk about some of those differences. So woodlands are open stands of trees with crowns not usually touching. So they generally form about 25 to 60% cover. The picture on the left here is an example of a woodland that's um, on a rocky outcrop. And this is traditionally where they've been found in a lot of areas of the West. In these areas, fire is limited because it doesn't typically spread where there's a lot of rock. You can see that there's not a lot of understory. There's limited resources. And so, yeah, traditionally or historically, that's where they've thought to be found. The picture on the right is a pinyon juniper woodland where trees are encroaching or infilling on a sagebrush step area. And you can see that as they start to infill, they really are starting to decrease on that area between trees. And so they're almost becoming more of a closed canopy stand. They're still considered a woodland because historically they were woodland, but this is a factor of different management techniques or strategies or the lack thereof. And so this is one of our big issues is actually this infilling and we are trying to get back to more of a historical, um, the historical area of pigeon juniper. Savannas are a little bit different than woodlands because they are typically tropical grasslands with some scattered trees or open canopy of trees. They're often a transition zone between forests and deserts. And a lot of times they can be found in that wide belt along the equator, um, just beyond the tropical rainforest. So some of the characteristics of a savanna would be that they have high temperatures. 
They typically have seasonally dry winters and summers, but they have abundant rain the rest of the year. This kind of creates a situation where they can have intense wildfires and wildfires during the dry season are really important in this ecosystem because they maintain the grasses in the understory and the tall trees that are not damaged during a lot of the cool ground fires that go through. So it kind of keeps the trees, keeps the grasses, but gets rid of the shrubs in between. Here's a quick video about savannas that I would encourage you to watch. Savannas arise along the edges of tropical deciduous forests as trees gradually become more widely spaced with trees and thorny scrub forests scattered about. Virtually all a year's precipitation of 30 to 50 centimeters falls on the trees and grasslands of the savanna during a rainy season of several months. During the dry season, no rain may fall for months and the earth becomes hard, dry, and dusty. Grasses are well adapted to the savanna's climate, growing very rapidly during the rainy season and dying back to drought-resistant roots during dry periods. Only a few uniquely adapted trees, such as the thorny acacia or the water-storing baobab, can survive the savanna's devastating dry seasons. The savanna is maintained by fires and heavy grazing of herbivores, which minimizes the opportunity for trees to grow and for the savanna to revert into dense thorn forest or tropical deciduous forest. The African savanna probably has the most diverse and impressive array of large mammals on earth, including herbivores from antelope, wildebeest, and buffalo to elephants, rhinos, and giraffes. Along with these herbivores come the carnivores who prey upon them, such as lions, leopards, and hyenas. Most of these animals wander the savanna in response to seasonal changes in the availability of food and water. It is in this environment of vast grasslands and scattered clusters of trees populated by huge herbivores and powerful carnivores that humankind arose. Abundant grasses that make the savanna a suitable habitat for so much wildlife can also make it suitable for grazing domestic animals such as cattle, sheep, and goats. As the human population of East Africa increases, so does the pressure of domestic grazing upon the savanna. Fences used to contain livestock increasingly disrupt the migration of the great herds of herbivores searching for food and water. Ecologists have discovered that native herbivores convert grass into meat much more efficiently than cattle and other domestic herbivores. In response, some African ranchers have recently begun to raise antelopes, ostriches, and other native grazers on the African savanna instead of cattle. Tundras are another rangeland biome type. And tundras can often be defined by their climatic limitations. For example, tundras typically have low precipitation. They have low temperature, meaning that they're usually cold most of the year. They have limited sunlight just due to their area of the globe that they're found. And all of these things kind of contribute to having pretty nutrient poor soils. So they have limitations on what plants can really grow in these areas. All of these things contribute to short growing seasons, which, which means tundras are treeless plains. They can have life, but it's usually really low growing vegetation and not trees. So once again, here's some images from Wrangell.org that can kind of help you understand the distribution of tundra across the globe. In rangelands, we classify tundras in two different ways. The first one is we say we have Arctic tundra, and this is located in the Northern Hemisphere, typically around the North Pole. It's what I think about when I think about cold areas that really have that low growing vegetation. One of the characteristics of Arctic tundra is that it typically has permafrost, which means that the soil is at or below freezing point for two or more years. So this obviously is as harsh conditions up there. We also have alpine tundra, and this you can find anywhere in the globe. You can find alpine tundra in Idaho. 
It's located in high mountain areas above the tree line. So that's also considered range, which is kind of fun to think about. This is a super interesting video about tundra, and they talk a lot about permafrost. So I would encourage you to watch this one because it's also really interesting. We are in northern Sweden flying over the southern eddy arctic tundra and about to get dropped off in what feels like a vast, beautiful nowhere. The land up here is both breathtaking and harsh. Try to predict the weather and you will likely fail. A hard realization for a camera person like me. Here's snow. It's a rainy day today. I'm here with my friend and researcher Mats Björkman and his team in the search for permafrost. The thing is, I said this was the arctic tundra, but one of the unique characteristics of this biome is a more or less permanently frozen ground called the permafrost. Only the top layer of the soil, the active layer, thaws in the summer. Or at least that's how it used to be. Okay, start measuring. Yes. So what is intriguing about this area is that we know that there was permafrost here about 15 years ago. Now it is gone. These guys are trying to find out the effects on the environment after the permafrost has disappeared. Right. The interesting thing with permafrost, I think, or why we investigated today, is the response of permafrost to climate change. So with the uh, increase in temperature, we also start to thaw the permafrost and we actually l lose permafrost in, in quite a few areas. This means that the huge carbon stock that's in there that has been frozen or built up for, for millennia start to be accessible for the uh, bacteria that's here and eventually it will get consumed and be uh, converted to methane or carbon dioxide in the future. So part of the problem is that permafrosts are disappearing as a result of increasing global temperatures. The other part is that permafrosts are believed to hold about 50% of Earth's underground carbon pool. This is old organic material that may have been trapped in this frozen environment for thousands of years. Nice. What happens when permafrost thaw is kind of like what happens to an old freezer that was accidentally left open, a potential feast for microorganisms that converts the old carbon into carbon dioxide and methane, and essentially contributing to speeding up the process that started it all. How all this will affect the life up here is the big question. Up here in the alpine tundra, you won't find any big trees, you won't find hardly any bushes either, but all the plants that grow up here are going to be low growing, close to the ground. One of the interesting species that is being tested up here is this little guy. This is Salix polaris, meaning that it's a member of the willow family. Normally we're, we're used to seeing willows as big trees, but these guys only stick up, you know, about that much. But they have a pretty extensive root system that goes down into the, uh, the surrounding soil here. And what is cool is that these woody roots can actually be dated just like we date trees when we look at the tree rings. The interesting thing is that these plants can be 50 years old or more. And the oldest part is somewhere around here. It's the main stem. Meaning that they would have been here when the permafrost was still present. By looking at the annual rings of the roots, Christopher is searching for a change in the pattern, indicating a time with unusual growth. And if I can find this increased growth, I will be able to see within a few years when the permafrost actually disappeared in this area. A first important step in figuring out when things started to change. Preparing for some soil sampling. It's almost better than before. Yeah. Our team is also collecting soil samples from the old permafrost soil and measuring the amount of carbon dioxide and methane coming out of the ground. I'll need to get this one started. All in an effort to try and find some clues that will help us understand the changes that this environment is going through. And it's not like the organisms up here have an easy life to begin with. The coffee pot. Without that, no one works. This is unfortunately not going to be a story where everything gets fixed in the end. The truth is that disappearing permafrost is becoming a problem in polar regions all over the world. We know that increasing global temperature is behind it. And what happens up here actually has more of an impact on our lives than we might think. 
As the permafrost continues to thaw, more of the carbon stock they contain is released and ultimately affecting the global climate even more. The question is then, is this such a bad thing? I know many times I wish that temperatures would go up and summer would last longer. The problem is that it's just not that simple. We're not in control of how the climate changes affect us. We can't choose the result. But we do know that the Arctic region is getting hit hard. The species that live up here are adapted to the harsh tundra conditions and are very sensitive to change. They're not strong competitors and new species can come in and take over. For many of the organisms that live in the Arctic, this is now a fight for survival. At our southernmost test site, this is very clear. The permafrost here is thought to have disappeared between 50 to 100 years ago, and now the landscape looks different, with tall shrubs and different species. Research like this is helping us understand both our role in this, and also what we can do to help these beautiful wild places remain. So those are kind of the rangeland biomes that we're going to talk about. Barren land, we don't consider rangeland. But you might be thinking, what about deserts? Where do deserts fit in when we talk about these biomes? Oftentimes, we use deserts to describe these different biomes. We might say we have a desert grassland, which you've heard, or a desert shrubland. So those are just kind of examples. So deserts definitely fit in to these different areas, but they're usually descriptors of one of these biomes. Deserts are really interesting and they're one of my favorite ecosystems. Desert grasslands and desert shrublands can be very diverse and, and just amazing how they can survive on not a lot of precipitation. So a few of the terms you should be familiar with when we think about desert is that um, we have arid or semi-arid deserts. Arid deserts are characterized by a severe lack of available water. They typically get less than eight inches a year, and because of this, they have a lack of vegetation. It doesn't mean that they don't have a diverse community of vegetation, but they just don't have a lot of vegetation. Semi-arid deserts, they also lack precipitation, but their annual rainfall is between 8 and 20 inches a year, so it's not extreme. Two other terms you should, be or you should consider would be a hot desert versus a cold desert. So not all deserts are hot all the time. In a hot desert, we typically think of areas that are closer to the equator, the tropical places. Cold deserts, on the other hand, are typically towards the polar regions or even on mountains where you're going to have a little bit flux or more fluctuation in your temperature. Hot deserts typically don't have seasonal effects versus cold deserts. You usually get a winter and a summer in these kind of, in these kind of ecosystems. Um, precipitation, like we talked about, is low in both of these, except evaporation is much higher in a hot desert versus a cold desert. So there's a few different ways that we describe different deserts um, in association with the different biomes. A third of the land on our planet is desert. These great scars on the face of the earth appear to be lifeless, but surprisingly, none are. In all of them, life manages somehow to keep a precarious hold. mile-an-hour winds blowing in from Siberia bring snow to the Gobi Desert in Mongolia.
from a summer high of 50 degrees centigrade, the temperature in midwinter can drop to minus 40, making this one of the harshest deserts of all. So that ends our uh, class today talking about the different rangeland biomes of the, of the world. Hopefully you enjoyed it. There are so many great things and I would encourage you to go and explore Wrangell because it's a great resource to really look at the world. <laughs>